Ben. Um, hello, everyone. I am, as you said, Ed Kinsella, the R&D director and co-founder of EM Acoustics. Um, the very imaginative name EM does indeed stand for Ed and Mike, and the, the mic is lurking back there. Uh, yes, as Chris says, we've been going about 10 years now. Um, we started out from you know, fairly basic beginnings, you know, straight out of university, no real uh, industry knowledge, knowledge, baggage, call it whichever way you like, and really approached the whole speaker design thing from scratch. And it's been a fascinating journey. I think it's simultaneously never been a harder or yet more fascinating time to be in this industry. It's uh, really quite astonishing the things that are possible now. So I'm here mainly to take you through briefly the new line array that we've brought out. It's been out about six months now. Halo C, uh, Halo Compact, just give it its full name. I've already started shortening it. Um, it's uh, slightly unusual in that it contains a ribbon, or to give it its proper title, Air Motion Transformer. Now, ribbons have been used before, um, but to my knowledge, this is one of the first implementations of this type of ribbon, and we'll go into a bit more of the technical detail about that later on. Eight inch LF driver, Air Motion Transformer high frequency driver, nested next to each other. There is a waveguide on the high frequency driver. Uh, the high frequency driver sits in line with the rigging there so that as it articulates, they stay as close together as they can. Um, so to give an indication of where it's sitting in the box, just one just has to look at the rigging. It's passive. One of our sort of house specialities, if you like, is passive networks. It's something that we have put a lot of time and effort into. Right around the time Mike and I started, passives had sort of begun to fall out of favour a little bit as, you know, at best a necessary evil as processing became more powerful and cheaper and, uh, you know, Biamp was king. But we sort of, st we stuck with the passive thing because there, it does have a couple of advantages. It does allow you to tailor the response and the reactance and the, the details of a circuit to a very particular type of driver, um, which when it comes to the voicing of a box is very, very useful. It's the way I describe it now, it's like uh, our boxes do have controllers, but they come free with every box. And they, they are what makes one of ours sound like one of ours, really, in that you have a similar voicing. We're often told that from our smaller boxes up through the bigger ones, they have a, a similar tonality, a similar voicing, you know, however one wants to describe it. And, and I think a lot of that does come down to the passive circuitry. It does give you certain levels of control. This one is passive. Um, it was a very challenging undertaking. Um, doing a passive line array <laughs> is so difficult because of the off-axis. Well, we'll come into this a bit later on, but the parallax effects off-axis are, are quite, really quite hard. So, first of all, I'll just quickly go through, um, as I say, it's been out about six months now. There have been a lot of shows that we've taken it out and used it on. Now, these are just going to go through, just briefly scroll through a few of these. It's, now, it's not just a shameless plug. It's also, um, I will actually refer back to a couple of these with respect to the way the box behaves and how it's been helpful and what we've learned about it. Yes, the first, the first big show was uh, Royal Philharmonic um, doing Fantasia at the Albert. We've since done two more there, which have been fascinating. Um, seem to be doing a lot of orchestral stuff. Uh, it's the BBC Symphony, uh, corporate event at Wembley, very low ceiling. We'll come back to that one as well. All of these have had their own challenges, and actually hearing the feedback from the engineers that have used them has been very interesting. And of course, the Natural History Museum. Fabulous, fabulous space, but acoustically pretty heavy going. Oh, and there's a little side bar there, actually. Um, again, I'll come back to that later, but we've decided to make it so that you can use these 
in a sort of smaller format, you know, in the, well, it's not terribly clear up there, but a small number perched on a sub, um, a lot of times particularly in corporate, you don't, you need 60 degrees vertical or even 40. Um, you're talking about people either sat down or stood up and uh, being able to skim in a localized fashion is very useful. So, right. What on earth is an air motion transducer? Or transformer, actually, I should say. This isn't actually something completely new uh, at all. This was actually invented in the early 70s by uh, <laughs> Dr. Heil, believe it or not, no relation. Uh, it's been around a long time. It looks a little bit like that. That's not actually the one that's in there. That's just a, that's a fairly generic image of one. The structure looks a little bit like that. Now, uh, a conventional ribbon driver, HF, you would have a strip, a conductor, or a set of conductors that sit between a magnetic field, and just as with a normal cone transducer, as soon as you apply the alternating current within that field, motion is produced, and out comes the sound. But the thing that's a bit different with an air motion transformer it doesn't actually move front to back. It's like a concertina or a set of bellows. And those waves that you see, those have conductors running up and down. And essentially, as the current is drawn, they pinch. And you actually get a, if, well, one has to be a little bit careful with uh, wording, but it, it, it is actually effectively like a form of loading. You get a high, uh, high volume velocity at the exit, which actually effectively does load the diaphragm also the effective moving area is very much larger. The exit of that ribbon is about one inch thereabouts. But if you were to actually unfold the concertina, it's probably more like five inches or so, giving a moving area which is actually slightly larger than a two inch compression driver. What's the big deal? Well, the main thing is, everyone's known about ribbons for a long time, lots of people very keen on them in hi-fi. They, you know, most people admit they do sound lovely. But power is the problem for this sort of thing, or has been. People haven't trusted using them, and at times with good reason, in terms of output. You know, the expectations on small boxes now are incredible in terms of what people expect them to do. The combination of this technology with advances in material science, N50 neodymium, you know, these incredible magnets that you can get now, which are just frightening things to handle, uh, have allowed companies like, you know, like me, uh, companies like ours, to start using something like this seriously in a box that could go in a very large venue, uh, which is very exciting uh, because they are completely different animals to compression drivers. I mean, they do have their own problems, but you don't have the classic sort of 14 kilohertz breakup of the, of the dome. You don't have the nine, nine, maybe even 10 to one compression ratio that gives the compression drivers their name. Air overload distortion in the throat, all of these sorts of things disappear. Plus you end up with, um, and this is the most exciting thing really from the point of view of a line array, is you have something that is plain generates a plane wave in the first case. We don't have to convert a spherical wave into a plane wave. It already is, which is excellent. And now, to give you an idea, I think the next slide should show the, yeah. So that is the measured vertical response of this box. Done in our anechoic chamber. Uh, so the scale's not terribly clear, but um, that's 0, 10. Uh, off-axis lobing, well, there really just isn't any. Um, it, it, not really to speak of. You, you, have to, you would have to move that scale down to something like 24 or maybe even 30 hertz before you start, uh, sorry, 30 dB before you started to see anything really. Very consistent from the point of view of particularly, and again, we'll come back to this, the top section of the line array. This is, this is really, really good news. So, that's what we've done, and uh, so far uh, <laughs> we haven't had any casualties, so the, um, 
the, they are holding up and uh, the, the advances in material science are allowing us to do these things. And one way I can shed a little bit more light on this in practice is I've got here a set of plots, which I'm going to bring up, which are generated in E's um, simulation program using the data from these boxes and the data from a conventional compression driver solution by from another manufacturer. I'm not going to say whose it is. That's not why I'm putting it up here. I'm putting it up here for you know, technical interest. Um, but suffice to say, it's a recognized way of doing it by a recognized manufacturer. And I'm, I offer it for, for your interest in terms of how a compression driver manifold simulating a plane source behaves versus a ribbon. So what we have here is 24 elements uh, in both cases, all these basically the same uh, conditions for both sets at all times. Uh, 24 boxes, one degree between each box, same scale. The scale isn't shown, but it's the same, so it, it doesn't matter. Um, the compression driver manifold on the left, the ribbon on the right. And as we scroll through, we should notice that the ribbon will stay, particularly this area here, will stay nice and true to the area that should be covered and rather less spill off axis vertically. Now, as the frequencies go up, I'm afraid things get worse for the compression driver as you reach a sort of a diffraction limit at the exit of the compression, manifold, compression driver manifold, it really ceases to be even a quasi-line. And you'll start to see now some blurring already at the outer edges as we go further up. It's really looking like, um, you yeah, know, there's a lot of diffraction taking place now at the exit of the box. But there's still a nice clean wedge there keep going. Similar sort of story. I'm afraid it just gets worse still. Uh, this is now um, probably something like 60 degrees in the vertical. Nothing one can do about that. No processing will fix that. It's a physical effect. And then once we get up to 16, much the same. If we go back to this picture, if you look at a venue like this, and in fact, to be honest, the same would apply geometrically even for a flat venue. The upper circle at the Albert seat, I mean, the Albert seat's about 5,000, depending on you know, how, exactly how it's laid out. The upper circle is about 2,000, and that is covered even in a situation like this where we're able to fly very high right by the organ by about four boxes a side. And it occurred to me that the further up you go, in any array, really. Once you get to the top box, it's covering the most people at the greatest distance with the least help. Here we had the RPO on stage. Frankly, you didn't even need the front fill, but they were there. You may have front fill, you may have infill. You're likely to have some help. Once you get to the back of door six, at 55 meters away at the back, you've got no help. It's all about those top boxes. So, I thought, okay, let's go for it and let's push all the cards in the favor of the top boxes and see how that plays out. I'm happy to report it played out well, otherwise I certainly wouldn't be here. It's quite, it really has been a fascinating journey this last six months to try to unravel why that works so well. Is it horsepower? No, I don't really think it is. I think it's a coherence thing. That the brain finds it far easier to unravel the information if the impulse arrives very clean, very sharp in the first instance. Uh, Miguel from Meyer gave a very good talk earlier today and he was talking about things like critical distance. Exactly those things apply, but I think there is an extra effect here. If you can get the first arrival, because the minimum phase will by definition be the first arrival unless you're around a corner, to be very sharp and very clean. The brain finds it quite easy to unravel the information, go, yes, that's a violin, or, yes, that's somebody talking. Is reasonably satisfied at that point and almost gates 
some of the rest of the nonsense. I mean, this is, as everyone will know, it's a very difficult room. But it dried out a great deal with this system, as everyone agreed who was there. And I think there's two sides to that. I think partly it is, as we saw on the ease plot, very sharp, cut off at the top and the bottom. Of course, that helps. But I think there is another factor, and we'll come on to the impulse a bit later on. And uh, I think from a psychoacoustic point of view, that plays a huge part. The box has been... I've tuned the crossover to make the single box frequency response flat. Um, it's always a bit of a tough call, this, because with any line array, you're going to, whatever happens, you're going to need some sort of compensation, you know, high shelf, low shelf, uh, low shelf to pull out the natural increase in efficiency due to the drivers being acoustically close below a given point. And a high boost um, air, you know, air loss. Uh, so we thought, okay, maybe the best, given that whatever one does, you're going to have to do that, uh, we thought it would be best to go from a flat start. So the, the individual boxes measure flat, and there's a set of programs that uh, one puts on top. Actually, I'll give you a little look at the crossover. It's only a two way box, but there's some, I've forgotten, there's something like 30. 34 components or something like that. It's a pretty bonkers. There's no room for any more. Um, and I actually ended up cutting that down. <laughs> there was a, that's actually all that one could fit in there. But there's a lot going on. The impedance correction for the individual components. Um, the internal EQ. The crossover itself, keeping it in quadrature on axis so that you get the best horizontal that you possibly can, given that the two things are in different physical spaces. Uh, here again, we can see where material science has crept forward. Um, coils like that, not long ago, would have been three or four times that size for that current capacity. But now there are new cores that you can get which don't saturate, but that uh, allow you to have very thick wires, which keeps a nice, fast, it's a tight low end, but without a coil that's this sort of size and you know, very heavy and very expensive. So there's lots of little increments that have moved forward. Um, and then that next one, yeah. Uh, so there's the impulse response of the box. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier. As much of the energy as possible arriving absolutely in the first instance, particularly trying to avoid pre-arrivals and things like that. Um, the theoretically perfect impulse would actually be, of course, just a line, well, pretty much just a line straight up and then straight along. You don't really want things coming down. Minimal ringing. And my impression is that that gives this sort of strange immediacy that the box has, where it's very clear but not, but not necessarily bright. It's, um, it's really quite interesting, but that's a... I'm a big believer in looking at impulses. I mean, you know, the magnitude and phase traces, they're sort of mathematical equivalents of each other, but in a way, I almost find, in terms of how a box, how you're going to react to a box, the impulse is almost more instructive than the magnitude and the phase. I mean, nowadays, you know, one would expect a box to be reasonably flat or it shouldn't be in this league, but how it behaves on the impulse, I, I think, personally, would, gives you a bit of a window into how it's going to behave at distance, over long periods of time, in terms of fatigue and all that sort of thing. So that's what we've been doing with it. Um, and uh, there's a, a rough guide to how we've put it all together. Obviously, the, the setup at the minute <laughs> is pretty much flat. Um, the rake in here is such that we didn't really need very much uh, to get from front to back. We've had quite a lot of success ground stacking this system, actually. It, uh, again, because of that coupling of the ribbons, you can really, you really can realistically get 35 metres to the back of a mixed position in a receiving house under a balcony, and it really will get all the way back there without having to thrash the people in the front row, which has been very useful.